to be here today with Professor Ranan Bustan, who is research scholar in the program in Judaic Studies, uh, specializing in ancient Judaism at Princeton University. Thank you for taking time to talk. Thanks. It's lovely to be here. Um, so to jump right in um, on some of your scholarship, how, how prominent were non-Rabbinic Jews in the Jewish community in late antiquity? The, the question of the um, numbers, the impact, the scope of what we might call non-Rabbinic Judaism is a very big question. And it's really one of the great unanswered questions of Jewish history, I think. We have a sense that um, when the temple still stood in the first century, um, the rabbinic movement, as we know it, has not yet come to exist. And by the 10th century, uh, it seems that much of the of world Jewry is, is rabbinic. Um, but we have very little understanding about how we arrive from one point to the other point where uh, the mass of Jews in the world look to rabbis to um, dictate and uh, help shape their um, Jewish lives. Um, it, it now seems, that, although it varies depending on who you ask, that most Jews in late antiquity, that's the period from around 150 CE to around 750 of the Common Era, were not rabbinic, um, and that the rabbinic movement, at least in its initial phase in the second and third century, was a very small movement uh, confined to a network of rabbis and their families and some followers. And therefore, we're dealing with the mass of Jews in the world, and we're not dealing with a small number. Um, some, by some estimates, the Roman Empire has 50 million people, and 10% of that empire, uh, as much as 10%, might have been Jewish. That means that um, millions of people would have been what we call non-rabbinic Jews. And the question is both one of the nature of their Judaism and how it changed over the course mm -hmm. of that first millennium. So there's obviously lots of variety here, but what are some examples of the relationship um, that, these, that these populations had to the rabbinic Jewish community? Well, initially, um, one of the great puzzles is that if you were to try to write the history of Judaism um, in what some would call the period of the Mishnah and the Talmud, late antiquity, uh, if you wrote the history looking at rabbinic literature, you would write one history. And if you wrote the history looking at uh, the archaeological evidence, you would have to write an entirely different history. In most cases, there seems to be very little relationship between these two bodies of evidence, although there's some fascinating, fascinating areas of, of overlap um, where we begin to see um, some kind of a relationship. But uh, to be perfectly honest, for most Jews in late antiquity, properly, we should be able to write their history without reference to rabbis, um, to specific structures of rabbinic halacha or um, communal norms as articulated in uh, classical rabbinic literature. Okay, so picking up there, so what are some examples of how halacha and halachic literature are uh, crafted at times in response to this population? Right, so uh, for example, initially, um, it would seem that the early rabbis um, related to uh, a category that they call the Ameha Haaretz, uh -huh. uh, which here um, doesn't mean Amaretz in the sense of an ignoramus, um, but may be um, those who do not conform themselves to rabbinic halacha, especially around issues of purity and of table fellowship. Um, the early rabbis are incredibly stringent about not um, eating with or marrying with or mm -hmm. even socializing with um, those who do not conform to uh, their branch of halachic Judaism. Um, and so that would be uh, uh, a population that's uh, apparently all around the rabbis and the rabbis, at least early on, before we begin to see a certain broadening of the rabbinic movement, a very stringent, almost quasi-sectarian relationship mm -hmm. between the very early Tanaim and the surrounding population. Who's proselytizing who? Like, who's pulling who in which direction? Uh, that's, again, very hard uh, to say. So if we um, look from the standpoint of the single largest body of evidence that we have, 
that's not rabbinic, uh, um, that would be synagogues, synagogue buildings, synagogue art, synagogue inscriptions. Um, by and large, it seems this evidence is disinterested um, or um, or simply ignorant of the pull of the rabbis mm -hmm. until uh, probably around the 6th and 7th century where matters start to change. Um, the rabbis themselves, in the course of the movement's history, begin to show a greater interest not in excluding others, but in uh, bringing their message uh, to others. And we see this in a number of ways. One example might be uh, a shift in... Um, the um, styles of midrash between the um, early halachic midrashim, say of the third century, to uh, what are often called the homiletical midrashim of the fifth and sixth century, where you begin to see forms, um, although many scholars are skeptical and don't think that these are actual homilies, they have a homiletical character that seems to be uh, more about um, outreach and conveying a message. And we have some of our later tractates. Um, uh, for example, Seder and Yahu Rabbah and a text like that, where you begin to see even greater attempt to convey a kind of basic, maybe minimal set of rabbinic norms to a much wider population. So I think that um, we're largely looking at um, a dialectical process in which uh, the rabbis imagine themselves as leaders and gradually become, uh, are able to project themselves that way, while um, what we might call non-rabbinic Jews um, are uh, increasingly um, drawn to or interested in uh, uh, rabbinic authority and look to the rabbis as their leaders. But how this ha a process happened um, over, um, um, over that millennium um, is very little understood. And this question of diversity then, I think, directly relates to what um, uh, I would call rabbinization. Mm -hmm. um, rabbinization is a term that's meant to capture this process. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, the way I conceptualize it is not as um, a kind of center that needs to, that has a message that needs to get out, but a kind of um, give and take between mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a shifting and changing rabbinic movement and rabbinic Judaism and um, all sorts of forms of um, non-rabbinic uh, Judaism that um, are uh, in its orbit. Um, scholars have been reluctant to talk about rabbinization, I think, for a couple of reasons. For some group of scholars, it's self-evident. Mm -hmm. Either the rabbis were always leaders, mm -hmm. Um, or uh, uh, it was inevitable that they would become leaders. Um, so and this is especially true for um, Israeli scholars that they're very reluctant to talk about rabbinization because it assumes that this wasn't either already the case or wasn't inevitable. There's a, a group of scholars that have also been reluctant to talk about rabbinization because they see it really as a product of the Islamic Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. This is really a story that only has to do with what happens once uh, the Abbasid Caliphate establishes Baghdad as a world center. 95% of the Jews in the world live in this massive Abbasid empire stretching from Spain and the Atlantic coast all the way um, through Iran. Uh, and uh, the Geonim establishing themselves in Baghdad were able to project rabbinic authority. So that story says nothing happened in late mm -hmm. antiquity. This is all a product of the Middle mm -hmm. Ages. Whereas um, I think that there are signs that a, a great deal was happening in the 5th, 6th, and 7th century that begins to show what you might call a kind of soft rabbinization mm -hmm. in which the rabbis are responding to um, the currents around them, some of those values and norms that they're responding to, while um, other sectors of society are beginning to recognize um, mm -hmm. rabbinic authority. Mm, fascinating. So last question for you, unless you want to add anything else. How, how does the way that the rabbis dealt with these, these Jews in general impact the way we might think about hot-button issues today, like intermarriage or denominational warfare or just boundaries of identity, inclusion and exclusion, these types of things? 
Um, I mean, I think that it, what's interesting, I think that I would stress the difference between then and now mm-hmm. is that um, most Jews, whether they are practicing or not, or practice one way or another, I think, think of Judaism in a rabbinic mold. Mm-hmm. And so uh, rabbinic Judaism um, is a, uh, even if incredibly diverse and fractured, is the sole framework. Whereas here, it's very hard for us to imagine a world in which um, the parameters of Judaism Mm -hmm. are not even uh, in dialogue Mm -hmm. with uh, rabbinic authority. Uh Uh, And that doesn't mean that they didn't have uh, what we might call halachic practices of purity, of marriage, marriage documents that that prescribed a certain way. Um, But those weren't um, the rabbis weren't dictating the norms. And so you might say this is a kind of a post-denominationalism, you know, of on the letter. I mean, that, that may be the case. Um, and that, uh, uh, and so maybe that would be um, what I would most want to say is that the world of late antiquity, if anything, um, should not be made to conform to denominational models and it should not be made to... Um, uh, and, and therefore, when we come to, back to the present, I think uh, it is um, intriguing and perhaps inspiring to think of a diverse non- or post-denominational Judaism having a precedent um, in history. Um, and, uh, and, and this may uh, be a resource for thinking about those cases in which rabbinic authority is being either um, misused or is being um, kept in the hands of a very mm-hmm. small institutional structure like the Israeli rabbinic, uh, um, the rabbinate in Israel. So not to oversimplify, but one of the things I think I hear you hinting at is that rabbinic dis- some connection to rabbinic discourse is constitutive of our Judaism today. Mm-hmm. Some relationship to it is, um, is kind of the glue that holds us together. And so it, it's really not comparable. In, uh, yeah, but I, I want to I kind of respect the question yeah. and, and, and think that, um, that to take seriously not just kind of diversity, but a kind of fundamental diversity in which, as you said, um, rabbinism is not constitutive of the Judaism that we're trying to describe, um, for which we have only piecemeal evidence, is something that may... Um, provide, uh, I don't think a model, but a sort of inspiration for those Mm -hmm. of us who are trying to think about Jewish forms of solidarity beyond and outside Mm -hmm. of um, movements and denominations. Mm -hmm. Okay, I lied. One last question. Um, And this is going to be a strange one, but um, there is no continuity between, I mean, there's very little continuity between then and now um, in certain regards. And yet I wonder who who is a part of the intellectual project today that most resembles what they were doing? Right, the rabbis of antiquity, um, people just assume it's sort of the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox rabbis, but which intellectual discourse that, that, that exists today is most similar to what they're engaged in? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 maybe I'll answer the question by um, talking a little bit about one of the uh, sources that I think what I've been talking about helps us to understand better, and that is the world of synagogue poetry, piyut. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, rather than seeing this body of liturgical hymnography from late antiquity as a kind of set of singing rabbis, um, we can see uh, a group of religious ritual experts who are engaged in an incredible creative poetic project that's Mm -hmm. centered in community and in communal celebration. So I think, you know, perhaps uh, there are examples, um, in Israel at least, of the revival of piyut, where you see um, art forms and engagement with longstanding uh, biblical uh, tradition and also rabbinic tradition uh, that um, crosses a secular religious divide Mm -hmm. um, and is grounded in a kind of... uh, literary expressiveness and artistic creativity and a communal dimension that involves singing uh, and, and celebration together. That might be one example of, of a space like what I would like to sometimes imagine 
the late mm-hmm. antique synagogue could have been. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, be sure to check out Professor Renan Bustan's uh, books and articles and scholarship. Thanks so much.